Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much, Madam Secretary. It's great to be here um, with you. The Department of Energy has sent a lot of money to the state of Florida, um, strengthen and modernize our power grid, build resilience as the climate crisis, and crisis worsens, uh, creating better jobs, uh, reducing energy burden and costs for disadvantaged communities. And this money was made possible thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law. Florida wasn't the only recipient. Obviously, you were also able to get the DOE to award funds directly to community organizations and solar companies in Puerto Rico in a model that I've heard a lot about on a trip I actually recently uh, took to Puerto Rico, ensuring that the award wasn't bottlenecked uh, with an administering agency. My constituents want to see this model used more broadly across the federal government, especially for folks in Puerto Rico, um, for HUD awards, Department of Justice awards, et cetera. So I'm just curious, how exactly does this model work, um, specifically as it relates to Puerto Rico, and can you talk about uh, uh, anything that you had to overcome, any administrative hurdles you had to overcome to make that happen? Yeah, thank you so much for this question. I mean, Puerto Rico, as you know, is very unique uh, in, uh, in the fact that there are layers of bureaucracy there to get anything done. Congress gave us a billion dollars to be able to do rooftop solar. Thank you so much for supporting that. What we have done is um, we we uh, went throughout all of the island to hear how we should be distributing this, how should we be prioritizing the putting of solar panels on um, homes. And citizens there said to a person, please prioritize people who, with disabilities, people who are poor and on, in last mile communities, and people who've got a health, um, a health issue. So we have done that. And we've done this by tapping local community members who, who are in the best position to identify who those people are. Verified, of course, through their, you know, are they qualified for SNAP, et cetera. They have to be a verification. But they are our, our eyes and ears and arms, really, on the ground to identify who should be able to get uh, rooftop solar. Uh, and so we're excited to begin that process. We hope that this summer we call the Summer of Solar for Puerto Rico and uh, to be able to make people energy independent in light of how fragile the grid is there. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, you know, what Americans want when it comes to federal funding is more community engagement, empowerment by directly granting awards to local governments, community groups, advocacy, or um, uh, nonprofits, organizations, and small businesses. Now, uh, a lot of my colleagues on this committee have been talking about their concern for American-made energy, and I want to talk about that. Fossil fuels like coal, natural gas, petroleum products are driving the climate crisis as we know. Clean energy comes from renewable, zero emission sources like solar, wind, hydroelectric, geothermal, and biomass sources. And the clean energy transition is urgent for humanity, but also for the state of Florida as we are a frontline community in the climate crisis. Advances in technology and grid management like those facilitated by the bipartisan infrastructure law shore up reliability of renewable uh, uh, energy. Madam Secretary, how can we combat the climate crisis without transitioning to clean energy? Well, you can't. Okay. And if we fell behind other countries in following these advancements in solar, wind, hydroelectric, geothermal, and biomass energy, how might that impact our ability to sustain and meet our growing energy needs? Well, let me just say that this is, uh, to, you know, our... Uh, allies, our economic competitors out there, they're all vying for a piece of this from an economic point of view. They mm -hmm. see the fact that this is a $23 trillion global market, this clean energy. All of these countries are going to need the products to be able to get them to their goals. So we, uh, we have a friendly competition with our, uh, our allies and our adversaries about who's going to get those jobs. Mm -hmm. And so on the jobs front, this is very important, and it's why the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan infrastructure law have been so impactful that we've got 600 factories so far that have mm -hmm. announced that they're expanding as a result of those incentives in the United States, making us competitive globally. So from a global competition economically, it's, it's vital. Obviously, we've got to do our part from a, a climate change perspective as well. All of the countries do. So we're working on both fronts, and actually one complements the other, and it's a win-win. Exactly. And I, I think it's a really exciting time in this work, too. I mean, we have the opportunity to build a new green economy, centers workers, fights the climate crisis, um, and where everybody can do well. And we can't shackle America, shackle our country, um, because not only are we going to suffer as a humanity, but we're, we lose out on the economic benefit. Um, 
And last question, Madam Secretary, can we invest in clean energy while also looking out for the workers who currently work in fossil fuel production? Absolutely, absolutely. It is really a, a primary focus, and I know, uh, Mr. Chairman, you're, you raised this as well. It's a primary focus of this administration. Leave no worker behind. Give them an opportunity to have a future-facing job for their children to have a future-facing job that pays well. That is the MO of this administration. Of course. Thank you so much. I yield back. Chair, now I recognize Mr.